time to well, we have put the please some activity in the class, which is a good thing. Uh, today we uh, have a presentation by Dr. Adam Orbe, uh, our colleague. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in social policy. His work is on uh, vulnerable and disenfranchised groups um, from, uh, from the perspective of the social justice approach, which I'm very curious to know what he's about. Uh, and he's also engaged in what is described as applied social science, which I'm also curious to know what it is about. So the floor is yours to talk about responding to voice, to community voice, in quite any participation. Thank you, Harris. That's a very nice introduction. That's good. I hope I know what this is about. That's a just point. Uh, hello, everyone. Very nice to see you. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation today based on some of my consult consultants' courses and evaluation work on uh, wine participation for my former institutions. If you can hear me over the sound of the microphones, it's a good sound of that. I'll just, I'll just stand in front of the microphone. Yeah, sorry everyone. No, it's the sound. Thank you. You can be closer and you can also be listening to this microphone, yes. Fantastic, yes. It's not the, uh, the best of circumstances. Thank you, everyone. So I hope you can hear me. Please tell me if not, and I will stop. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, very nice to see you. I'm going to do some today on wine conservation, which is basically the collection of policies that we introduce to try to approach um, the problem of inequality in access to HG. There's things we do around mentoring, community outreach support, reaching out to young people, to families, and to the poorest part of the UK what my work we've been looking at for the past uh, five years or so. It's based on the Bracken Back Hayster study I did back for my own institution a little bit, but really it's moving forward now towards my next iteration of the project. How we actually articulate this and try to make it something uh, like, a, like a, a manuscript, basically. So if it work in progress, please excuse me. It will get hopefully a bit more finalised as, as, as the months go on, but um, it's kind of coming together a bit by bit. Uh, so yeah, this is a bit of an introduction to me, who I am. As Kara as said, I'm an applied social scientist, most of all. Uh, what I mean an applied social scientist, I take what we call middle range theory, theory, in terms of sociological theory, and apply it towards trying to solve social problems in different ways. Usually with a policy analysis response to reflect on how we can negate those problems and deal with them. Uh, my current projects include things like looking at social harm, Global youth led market security. We've got a special issue about coming out later this year. Uh, so if you're interested, it'd be great to send it to you. So please, please do let me know. Um, I'm doing a project with MHJ at the moment on grief counseling prisons, looking at human rights issues, uh, which is a bit out there, but again, as an evaluator, I was quite interested in helping them. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is this project, it's one of the future voice, um, social justice approach. And I generally do evaluation work around supporting young people and youth policy work. Um, so that's what I've got. That's me, for those of you who, who have not met, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, so far in terms of research and contact. And stuff. Um, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about evaluation uh, to PG uh, and evaluation of the work I've done a little bit. Um, and we're going to basically present two little projects I did as part of this wider work. An evaluation of staff and schools and colleges in the West Yorkshire and other regions as well as an evaluation of community work, outreach work I did, uh, in relation to supporting uh, people and vulnerable groups in the community. And I'm going to try and tie it together, which is what we want to do in the to make it So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, and really, I'm going to start with just a bit of context about HE, uh, access HE UK landscape somewhat. Uh, since 2010, it's been a legal provision for all HE institutions to basically provide an access and support plan for wine conservation students to enter HE, something which we, we have to do by, by law, basically. Um, and this has meant there's a, a lot of cool concentrated effort by HE institutions, by consortia, to try to implement a lot of activities in this sector. So the tune of about 830, up to a billion pounds a year spent on it in the UK context, and this kind of average work. Um, despite two or three decades of this work, um, I'm quite sad to say that UK is still quite deeply socially stratified in terms of access. Um, we see positive rates um, particularly being impacted by uh, class, by gender, by 
this is the intro to the of content. Um, some key things which I'm just going to reflect on here include things like preschool meals. We can see we've got students who like receipts for preschool meals. Uh, they are far less likely to enter AG in comparison to students without preschool meals. Uh, in comparison from 28 to 47%. We also can see certain geographical wards and areas where there is a very low density of participation rates for some students falling to 10%. And we see this in quite a lot of social mobility conditions. So we have a problem here. We put spend money on the problem, we're trying to resolve it, but yet we are still not close to actually getting somewhere of narrowing these inequalities and doing something about these issues. Um, so that's kind of the angle that I'm coming from as a content. Um, and there's kind of three components of WP work. Oh, that's nice about the sounds coming from there. <laughs> I don't know we should speak too soon. Uh, and there's three components of, uh, of, of WP. Uh, I'm focused on the Atlas HG arena, that's the kind of the space I'm looking at today, but I think it's important to spend the wider context. Of course, there's inequalities of energy, something we're all familiar with as lecturers and teachers that we all know about from a, from a kind of more uh, experience of, of, of staff. And of course, there's a kind of third component, which is the kind of entry into graduate aid market. Um, I just worked on that before, and I tend to look about in terms of graduate aid market inequalities and the issues around uh, disadvantaged students in that space as well. So, we're looking at the first one here today. Um, so, to give a bit of context to the type of work that WP is focused on, we reflect on things like career focused events, information events about HG, one to one mentoring, statement workshops, student finance talks, and the rest of it. All these things which I think we probably all have some familiarity with uh, around focusing and, and potentially helping uh, students from um, distance backgrounds, from different backgrounds to enter into PhD. Um, and these are kind of normative. We see these in most of these kind of plans and access agreements I mentioned before. These are the types of provision we tend to kind of focus on most of all. Um, they tend to be focused on the campus space uh, or residential spaces, like the summer school thing. But we tend to do these things mainly on campus or we go out to the schools themselves, uh, most of all. Um, and this is what kind of modern WP tends to kind of look like uh, in the context um, of, of the UK. Um, and one of the things that we do as evaluators in this space, and the government are quite interested in, is understanding whether this stuff is doing the things that they want it to. Is it supporting people into HG? Is it creating the type of social change that can ameliorate the inequalities I mentioned previously? So you've got interesting questions around the government are raising, I should say, more than, more than most, around the kind of efficiency of these, of, these, of these kind of things. And to give you some kind of anecdotal kind of context to this, and I was chatting to Paula from marketing recently here at Lincoln, and she was kind of saying, we can see that when students do this type of work on campus, that their retention rates to come to university a year later goes up uh, in open school. So there's real differences in how these kind of policies and, and provisions kind of shake out and what they tend to do. Um, in different as well. So that's what, what we're looking at a little bit. And that's what I tend to evaluate as part of my work with, with, with working with UniConnect and so on. Um, the policy landscape in the UK goes back, way back to the Deer Report in 1997, way, 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 way back to the 90s, WP. But I'm just going to talk about a couple of big initiatives um, that kind of shape and frame some of the work I'm going to talk about today. We firstly had AIM Higher in 2004 to 2011. AIM Higher was actually a bit earlier than that, but formerly in 2004 to 2011. And this introduced something called POLAR, something which you might be familiar with. This is essentially a measure of participants so rates of HG dependent on um, <coughs> kind of uh, geographical position and capacity and so on and so forth. This was the first introduction of kind of localized ward level data in this area. Um, and overall, I think Empire did some good. Um, it kind of was framed as a policy failure, if you look at it by, by government ministers at the time a little bit. Um, although there was austerity and they were looking to cut things, I'm always a little bit wondering if there was some cynicism there and how they saw it. Um, one of the issues it had was causality remained elusive. Um, to say that AMI was causing the kind of changes became more challenging. Um, and they kind of introduced some, some issues of it where they kind of renamed target groups, renamed participation rates, um, and the measurements. And that kind of caused complications with AMI. Um, we moved towards something called the National Collaborative Irish Partnership, which is now the Green Connect. Um, after this, and this was based on taking some of these kind of ward level understandings of inequality and using them much more to target provision regarding uh, the WP that we were doing. 
So, for instance, partnerships um, were aimed basically every UK consortium, or the UK does a partnership. So, if there's a Lincolnshire one, there's a North Yorkshire one, there's a West Yorkshire one, there's a London one, and so on and so forth. Um, these partnerships essentially were grouped together to try and get universities and charities and local partners to try and work as platforms for the UK. Um, we wanted to deliver out these programs for your people in the year, year 9 to 13. Um, and they base it on a, an algorithm where they said we can analyze a certain expectation of GCFC and participation rates based on our assumptions. So they kind of said, basically, we think that we can work out where there should be participation based on, on our analysis of data. Um, they found gaps, they observed these at lower levels. They kind of emphasized that where there wasn't this kind of expected participation, this was down to kind of social and cultural inequality. Kind of framed for more geo in lens, essentially, of human and social capital, and where these kind of uh, where the kind of levels of capital were, it's how they kind of framed it most of all. Um, this is kind of interesting work. So this is what, what they kind of started to use as a way of framing and understanding uh, participation in this context. Um, I've got two slides there, and of course, at the heart of all this, a little question. They wanted to, again, as I mentioned before, understand whether the WP work that we do is actually working in the way that they want it to. Um, so there's a focus on finding what works for evaluating WP. This is Les Ebden, uh, who was an advisor to the Sociability of Government and talked about some of these issues. And he's always about what works best, showing best practice across the sector, demonstrates the government the value investment in this area. So this is a question the government are, are openly trying to explore in all sorts of ways. Um, and there's some complications, which we're going to talk about that a bit later, of their framing of this discourse and how they see evaluation as well. So this what works approach, randomized control trials, gold standard kind of kind of research kind of methods that we see in health and medicine, these are the type of things that they'd like to see. And they try to apply it, and they're still applying it in the context of the VP, with quite interesting reflections around how to play that. So that's where we are, setting some of the scene of it. Um, and really, to drill down a little bit further, they wanted to capture and demonstrate what impact was. They wanted to then say, okay, we'll support these activities that are doing the things we want to do, that are improving access, participation, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's also the challenges in this. These consortia, the community health consortia, don't necessarily have the expertise, the methodological expertise to do some of these things. Uh, it's quite expensive to get people like me in to kind of evaluate your work, and I try and keep costs down because I care about doing this work. But there's always a question around those things. Um, different cultures, practices around WP, what works in one context doesn't work in another, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, and how do we actually say what works definitively? It's always a bit more complicated. Um, and of course, the cost of implementing new, new complicated initiatives in different locales and different spaces, and so on and so forth. So there's interesting challenges right from the off that they were negotiating, and are still negotiating in regards to this work. Um, so what I got involved with, and my involvement in this work, was through this particular uh, um, project uh, about 2017, 2018 or so, uh, called Go Higher West Yorkshire, who were essentially the West Yorkshire consortia of the WP. And I basically, I got approached by a colleague at Leeds University who said, Adam, you do research on young people, you do research on education, you like methods, do you want to do this? And I was like, oh, okay. Sounds quite cool. And then I just found this project and I really loved it and enjoyed it and just kind of ran with it as much as I could, really. Because uh, it's just something I care about, I care about obviously trying to support young people in all sorts of contexts. But this was something where I thought I could really help and do something meaningful, which is something that I, I, I really wanted to do. So, Go High West Yorkshire, they are essentially a consortium that essentially look after Wakefield, uh, Leeds, and Bradford, so quite a large geographical space. They've got about, I think, 20 million pounds or so, so it's quite a big organization. They mean they operate around on the terms of in all these ward areas and so on. Um, and they wanted to engage a realist approach in their work. They wanted to say, okay, this is what works question. How can we find a way of proving this positive work we're doing is demonstratively making the impact we want to make? So they came and spoke to colleagues at Leeds, such as myself, trying to figure out what to do. Um, and we gave them advice, uh, Ray Corson, colleague, uh, colleague this work, and I and Gemma tried to help them to think about these things, was to capture the complexity of these practices, the complexity of what was going on at the type of intervention level, and try to understand the context, the different communities we're talking to, the different locales we're working in, for instance, 
And what we want to see with how this kind of complexity, we're concerned in making use of kind of what we call in the real research and um, kind of context mechanisms and outcomes um, and understanding why one thing works in one area but perhaps it doesn't really work. What's going on there? Can we understand that? And going beyond that, what works best into why is it working here? Why is it working there? And so, on. so that's the thing we were trying to do and help them elucidate in terms of understanding their work. And to give you a little bit of context, this is the geographical wards. I don't know if you can see this so well on the screen there, but we've got Wakefield down here, we've got uh, Bradford just uh, to the west over here, and we've got Leeds here as well. And these wards were identified as areas where participation was particularly low, basically. Um, and of course, they all have their own kind of characters, their own cultures, their own values, their own complexities, um, and we have to be careful about comparing and contrasting them. But what they wanted to do was understand well, what was happening in the context of Wakefield, the more rural communities, for instance, um, and old kind of mining communities, versus the kind of communities of Leeds and the centre of Leeds, and again with Bradford and so on. So trying to understand the context of, as to why uh, some of these issues uh, were kind of quite prevalent and pervasive uh, in the context of the communities of Leeds. So these are the things that we did, that we, we tried to plan and work around and help. Um, we did realisation, as I mentioned before, this complexity was quite a key thing, but there's also some pragmatic things about realisation that are helpful. It's method neutral, you can do quant follow with it. Um, you can essentially do a process evaluation, so you can tell a story, which is quite important. We wanted to kind of showcase that to them as well. Um, it gave us a nice uh, way of explaining gaps at one level. And um, really what this does, a realist position, is accounting for Essentially, things that exist outside ourselves. It's not a constructive discourse or, or positive framework. It's about the things that exist outside of us. And we felt this was a nice way of articulating some of these questions around context as well. So that's kind of why, why we did it. Kind of um, I've got lots of these, but I won't spend too much time on it. But it's a nice way of thinking about it. Um, it's kind of maybe a cold between constructive and positive thinking. Um, the voice just a better of problems of deductive hypothesis building and kind of output that kind of tries to frame between slightly different, which makes it quite useful for process evaluation and some of these things. Um, so what we tried to do to make this much simpler and hopefully a bit more interesting, <laughs> we tried to go beyond what works, we tried to say what works for who, what circumstances does it work, in what respect and how. That's basically it. The realist formula is that how does this work, who's it working for, and um, what circumstances has this work. And we basically have a formula that we use to kind of understand this. We have mechanisms, concepts, and outcomes. Uh, mechanisms refers to this idea of social or psychological drivers that might cause reasoning of actors. Um, so we usually see this as a combination of reasoning and resources. Um, we have contexts, which are usually more institutional things. We take a context something, how's that reshape reasoning, recontextualize it? How's it misfired a certain mechanism in a certain way, for instance? And then we look at the different outcomes of that, we look at patterns. Um, now, some realists will go into lots of mapping of all this stuff, obviously more as a general philosophy when they kind of use it as a way of thinking about it, but it depends on how you, how you might frame it a little bit as well. So that's kind of how we, we framed it a little bit. And there's a nice formula for it here, where we have kind of um, our patterns of outcome for an evaluation, we have an kind of intervention running across here, then we have a mechanism here yeah. and the context around it. And that might all change and shift our outcomes and explain why certain things happen in the wrong context, but not in another. That's the idea. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. I'll come back to this in a bit. It's a little bit, it is a little bit realism, but sometimes it's like strange to think about. Um, so why we liked it for this, we thought it was quite useful for WP because um, it can really help us understand what's going on in community space, our concepts in spaces. We can look at things like locations, individuals, relationships, institutional arrangements, wider infrastructure, um, and we can really make a good explanation for why these gaps are existing and what we need to do about them. How do we do something about solving these issues? So, moving on just a bit to things I actually did a little bit. Um, we did two projects about this. We did a realization of staff and schools, introduced as part of Go High West York, which is a £100,000 grant that we were evaluating at the time. And the first thing we did was okay, let's get our staff into schools and we'll do more WP in those spaces. That was including kind of all those wards I mentioned before and all those schools and colleges that they could get themselves into, not all of them, because there's some challenges around that, but for most of them. Um, and really these staff were kind of staff who were trained, CPD trained, and had the target to basically 
try to improve WP provision, try to add volume to it. Um, and we've just looked at kind of focus groups with these staff and just interviews with them to understand what's happening in these concepts and in these places. And um, we've got a logic model here, which really is very key in what I'm doing. And we have basically inputs, processes, outputs, and outcomes. But basically, you want to get to a point where these staff were essentially able to create new spaces of WP activity, shifting cultural dynamics if they could, but they actually introduced the idea of WP a little bit more, normalizing it and so on. Um, and also trying to make more bespoke delivery plans on behalf of the young people they were working with. So they could understand need, understand what support mechanisms were required, and then support those students appropriately through the through their interactions with them. So we have a bit of a, a, a model explaining that. Um, we also had a theoretical kind of uh, reasoning for this around uh, Kresel's logic of sense of place. Um, we found this was quite nice because we could see sense of place being a way in which when a staff member is not familiar with the community, uh, they can do more of the things that, that might result in, in more improved WP, such as they can kind of look at this space as activity spaces, they can see spatial networks, connections, locations, um, they can be more familiar, they can be more helpful, they can build trust, they can do all the things which good WP practice should do in many, many ways. Um, and they can do so obviously supporting students appropriately as well, be part of it. And um, so we, we like this idea of place, we use this as a kind of framing of our central theory as to why this, this we would hope to see the change in terms of as well. And really what we saw, we did it. Basically, when happens were more familiar with their institution, this kind of sense of place triggered four outcomes. They increased more WP, they got more targeted WP, there's more organization familiarity, and there's more normalization, generally speaking, when it works. When it works, it doesn't always work uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but that was the model we found when things had worked quite well. And to give you some examples of, of this, um, we see so increased volume and spread delivery. Um, we can see that some staff are talking about um, head of staff who've been there making quite significant difference to outcomes, their partnership building, that sort of their spread delivery, and so on. And, and head teachers have been particularly quite pleased about that. And um, opening spaces, WP, um, you know, trying to get a sense of, of, of talking to them about what that is. Um, we feel like we're going in for a new perspective, not just one person there, uh, kind of, sort of, I would say, quite uh, eloquently. Um, so yeah, giving them more of a sense of you have a say in your future, right, rather than telling them what is your which is always a bit of an issue with this kind of work. Where it worked less well is where uh, there might be some institutional complications as to why these arrangements wouldn't work so easily. For instance, uh, where some focus groups kind of noted that we've not really had the space to get the work done, Head teachers not realizing the role, its identity, of what it's there to do. Um, there's also some complications, which I'll talk about in a moment, around barriers outside of schools and institutions and colleges. So questions around, you know, how do we do things in the, in the family space, in the community space? So this is where the next part of the project kind of came in. And um, we started thinking, okay, um, I can do this work in this space, but what about what happens afterwards? Um, it's barriers with a lot of parents as well sometimes. It's kind of, kind of complicated issues around that that might keep the that going as well. Um, so the, the sense of, of, of trying to explain or explore these issues obviously needs to be with quite sensitivity and with parent involvement and family involvement where possible too. Um, and really this kind of came up with a, an interesting kind of reflection to this. We realised that it wasn't enough just being institutions. We've got to get into community spaces much more. So for instance, um, there's a kind of worry that you might see um, a kind of belief of selects to come to the school, something that perhaps we could focus on in the colleges, the community center, that. that sort of angle of getting embedded in the community so it's not the book of our job, um, that would be kind of really useful to do as well. So we thought maybe we should reflect on how we, we could do that and do these principles work in those spaces? Can we get this working within these communities in different ways? So looking at that and exploring it, we looked at a second project. Um, and we have a similar idea, but we'll use the sense of place again. But this time, we're going to look at it in the community space much more explicitly, uh, particularly. We had a £100,000 grant that we evaluated, um, and we looked at essentially what happens when you try to do stuff outside of the institutional space. Through charities, through uh, our kind of HEPs, we call community outreach offices. Um, and we looked, I evaluated all this, I, I looked at charity reports, and interviews. There's a report that is too close to, nearly done, not quite done getting there a little bit, kind of showcasing this, I'll send them when I'm ready, people are interested. Um, 
So we start looking at this a little bit. And what we did now, we looked at case studies. We basically looked at a few organizations that were doing specific work of young people and families in our different community spaces. Ranging from Bradford, all the way to Keeley, to Leeds, and so on. Um, and we looked at basically an evaluation of what they were doing in different contexts and so on and so forth. Um, and we basically examined how the work they were doing was essentially supporting uh, young people in different ways. Um, interventions in the community can include things like, um, for instance, if you move on to the Uh, things like creative art focused projects. We got them playing a slime for a bit, which I had a lot of fun with, to be honest with you. Uh, we got them kind of reflecting on photography projects. You know, for instance, there's a really lovely work where we got them doing um, photography projects in Bradford, but they community project photography of their own spaces, understanding what that was, and so on and, and so on. And um, we'd also have individual interventions for charities, so group mentoring, and the mentoring shifted. Because rather than just being institutional in previous spaces, we then were doing it in a space where they felt they had trust in the people they were working with. Um, so it really reshaped some of the stuff we, we kind of thought WP did a little bit by doing it in this way. Except the liberation of the booth groups and spaces and so on and so forth. And I'd say try to reflect on the different languages. Um, as I mentioned before, we felt that this helps us elucidate different contexts. Uh, the key point is tapping into the social relations that learners have habit, um, and in these spaces, you can see that 3P has the potential to be much more transformative than what it does, um, in the support you can offer to learners to access it and help them decide what they want to do. So that's kind of what we did here now. And we did, to give you some examples, this is Featherstone, this is just near uh, Castle, Castleford in, in West Yorkshire. Uh, obviously a big rugby, rugby league town uh, up there, to be honest with you. Um, and for instance, we kind of uh, use sort of questions like this to try and talk about the VP and use the platform to build some new questions. Um, my family are all massive Professor Rovers fans, so I'm calling, well, very little, but I have to say, if I can't remember meeting my doctor, Professor Rovers, and then actually using some of those kind of relationships to reflect the VP and the G and reflect the VP's part. So, what this kind of came down to in the end was, like I say, reflection on the different ways in which sense plays might play out in this context. So it might, might be somewhat different. Um, for instance, we looked at things that were sometimes could be like, why this kind of worked. We felt some place in this context was an effective platform for officers to innovate WP, to find the right intervention for the right need. Um, they could build trust, they could pave away future questions. Sometimes you'd have an outrage activity. Um, and through that activity, you start initiating conversations. You start to have conversations with people um, you know, might not be able to have an informal setting. Um, and things like, you know, I'd say claim the sign, which is uh, so a good one. The importance of the formal relationships also came out here. Uh, we had much more space for individualizing the interventions. So the sense of mentoring shifted here a little bit, the model shifted. Um, it's just this quality, not just quantity, just by having these smaller groups, just as one relationship can really build up the report. We do something much more meaningful to support these groups. And that's what we thought of this was and just a few more mechanisms that kind of came out of this, and please excuse me, I need to kind of think of these a bit more, but hopefully you can kind of sense where the work's going in a little bit. Um, we saw kind of interesting as well informality. The fact that you had charities doing this work meant that the, the kind of trust or the lack of trust in HG can be somewhat ameliorated. Some of these communities do not trust HG because they're formalized institutions, and they don't necessarily want to engage them directly. So reflecting on, on how other ways you can do that um, is quite interesting. The charity seems a, a nice way of reflecting on that question. Um, and this is particularly from Bradford Street Support Network. They're a charity involved with doing kind of mentoring work, particularly in Bradford. Um, and they say here, cultural autonomy to build education is positive for the middle language barriers. Uh, they don't connect to different institutions. They do not understand the language of the processes. That kind of formalized structure can be something that is challenging to the day, and it's challenging to negotiate. Um, and they're saying, look, we know these communities, we can do this work by helping because of our relationships in, in these spaces. Um, similarly, you might also say that the role models of these kind of interventions provided were quite positive. Things such as um, the way in which the, we often would employ people who have the same, who have the same cultural background as, as our target group, as it were. Um, so they can resonate with their own lives, um, have a sense of being able to talk to them and so on, um, and they're given an opportunity uh, to, to kind of uh, to use role models in a way that really supports people uh, and give a sense of, of how people 
you know, get to prep sort of competition. So actually having those conversations um, in a more, again, formal way as well, not necessarily kind of formal. Because a lot of times you see role models come in and they can be quite top down, whereas this is more on the same level, it's engaging on a level where people believe in school, which is really important, with a reciprocal relationship. Um, and lastly, the other thing that's really enabled was a mechanism of family involvement that is sometimes missed from the WP framework. Things such as um, speaking to family, parents, sorry, that's the same one, this is the one I was after. Um, and this is basically another key thing. Parents really want to get involved, but not being sure how to, how to articulate a way of, of understanding these, these processes. Um, so what Royal Charities, Bradley Community, Church in Bradford, um, they were fantastic. They engaged with parents most of all. They didn't really talk to, to learn so much, but they wanted to do parents. And they did, they did fantastic about raising confidence and talking to them about these different things. Um, and building this sense of, of, of knowledge base as well, which is often the other part of this. Especially on finances and debt, and some kind of uh, concerns around those things. So, including all that, half hour of me banging on. Um, the kind of point about all this, I guess, with what works paradigms particularly is that there's a nice idea of what works, but you can't universalize that all the time. You've got to think about the, the contextualized way in which different initiatives engage and work in different contexts and so on. And a nice way of summing this up is what happens in a sunny day in Lincoln is not the same on a rainy day in York. It's one of the way I thought that, but a nice way of framing it. Um, there's a really interesting question of the abortion with outreach, how good it could be if it was funded properly, some of the weaknesses of it, which I haven't touched on sports here today. Include that it's expensive, it's challenging to run, there's lots of negotiation with different organizations and partnerships that you have to do. Uh, and it's hard to evaluate. It's not got that quantitative randomized control trial stuff to government like, which is another complication. Um, I think there's something in the idea of mutually reinforcing institutional community based WP, like using global spaces in a concurrent way so they're actually doing something more meaningful. I think there's something there that may be worth exploring. Um, real salvation. We're trying to say to, to the Office of Students, please carry on with this work, it's really good. Um, this contextual information is really, really, really helpful. Um, try to reflect on things beyond WP. One of the things that they want to do now is reflect on small scale projects and adding evidential kind of quality and efficiency to those particular approaches. So British evaluation is perhaps a nice way of doing that on a kind of smaller scale um, as well. Um, so yeah, last thing I want to leave you with is a larger model uh, that I tried to build uh, last week. <laughs> Just trying to explain all this, please excuse me. And you've got here, like, essentially, the school college, number one, the, the second point, uh, the wider community space, and then you've got this kind of mechanism of what outcomes you want to get to. Tell us about young people. If you have both of things in place, you might be able to make those outcomes, but if you remove one or the other, you might not, right? And that's what happens. That's the kind of shaping of context I'm referring to there, in particular. And um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Right, thank you for your thank you. Uh, for uh, for questions in Britain. Yeah, I so. It's, it's really great to hear colleagues researching in this format, so thank you very much. And I um, enjoyed that. There's a lot in there, it's very, very, very rich. Um, I've got a few questions, a couple of questions, and a couple of comments. I mean, I was involved in my previous job at Cotton Crooks, I was involved in a widely participation program called Crooks Engage. We used to run these sort of sessions after school for these kids in the, sort of the lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and I quite enjoyed that, but my sense is that this sort of widely participation agenda seems to have slipped somewhat. I'm not entirely sure what's going on with the group and I'm also very interested to hear some thoughts on that. In, in terms of specific, specific questions, the first thing is I was wondering how exactly is participation uh, conceptualised by some of the but universities disagree with that actually, it's about funds or seats. Perhaps government institutions, Department of Education, whatever it's called now, um, is it something else? <laughs> and actually, for the, for the intended targets, for the prospective students, the, 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 the cohort of young people that are seeking to be brought into something in participation, is it just about engaging? in these types of activities. So I was just wondering how is participation conceptualized by these different aspects and, and how is that kind of frame of recruiting? The second question is I'm struck by if it is about the extent to which these young people 
then sign up and go to university. What, um, I suppose there was no kind of discussion around the big numbers of tests, like particularly during this period when these were out. And if we're talking about you know, young people from you know, different, different Typical socioeconomic backgrounds, actually, money, the economics of going to university, you think of how much more expensive it was, and there's an exception. But to what extent does that frame actually psychological actions and also parental actions? You did bring parents in the end, and I was just about uh, Yeah, how do parents kind of understand this concept of education? There's a lot of questions there, so I'm just sorry about that. So a lot of the community stuff, that there was a lot of investment in that kind of just kind of went there. We've gone right back to, right, you got the grades, that's the focus. And that's uh, that's caused quite a lot of, uh, I don't know, argument, I suppose, debate in the community. Um, there's a particular consortium called PESO, and they are essentially the government's kind of uh, leading kind of organisation to organise the evaluation of this work as well. Um, and they're very much ingrained in that culture of, 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 of patient education and focusing on, on more content. So um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's dropped off a bit as well, as you said before, mainly because of wider policy debates, and the Brexit and all other stuff. But the changes in ministerial um, focus, also Michelle Donovan, who was there, who's now moved on to somewhere else. There's been lots of different kind of people coming in and out of the department, and that's shifted the focus a little bit to the extent. Um, so absolutely, it has, it has dropped off a little bit. Um, I think that's a really, 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 really positive point. Um, just a point you made about conservation and measurements, I think it's a really interesting one because that's a really, we have something in the consulting use called HEAT, basically, which is like higher educational uh, uh, tracking data or something like that, something like that. And uh, basically, they look, at, they look at essentially your intention to university. <laughs> I don't think they necessarily look at whether they've actually got that. And, and they don't follow up as well. So there is a difference there. I think that's quite important. I suspect they do analysis and check that those numbers are pretty like the life as it were, but there is an interesting conceptualization of that, which I think is really, really, really intriguing. Um, the third question about parents, yeah, absolutely, right? Um, I didn't mention, um, but the, there's a really interesting point around if you don't get parents engaged within WP, you really, really limit its, its potential because there's so much more going on where a young person, a learner, might need to talk to a parent about these quite complicated decisions and so on. Um, and this is a really challenging thing in communities where there is a kind of support, a, a slight ambivalence towards the G and, and one of those things as well. So yeah, it's a really intriguing part. And I think at least we're seeing more awareness of that issue as well in the literature. I think they are realizing that more and more. That's, is that right? Yes, of course, I just have a question about the yeah, absolutely. So we know people. So what, what's interesting about these? Forty-seven, forty-seven percent, I think now have gone to PG this year. Like you know, so the the demand for PG is still true. That should be fine. But if the demand is still high for PG, but in terms of the groups that we're talking about, we are still seeing the kind of fears around debt and fears around fees and the particular kind of um, rationale of of this being something that's hanging over me, you know, towards like you know, my, my life. And, and they aren't wrong in many ways, so that's absolutely accurate point to make. So there's a real question around how those things are framed on the tour. And it's interesting because those psychological reasons I think need to be kind of reflected on. And I think that again that comes back to parents and their understandings of it as well. So I think that's a really, really key thing. The interesting thing about these though is that the demand for HG, broadly speaking, is still high, you know what I mean? It's not putting off students generally, which I think is kind of so the levels of understanding and reasoning there might be different. I think it's probably interesting. Right. Well, uh, before I give the, uh, the sorry, sorry. Thank you. questions, I uh, would like to ask whether someone from the teams wants to ask a question, please raise your hand or write it on the comments and I'll have it in the video. Yes. Can give them a jab? Okay. Um, thank you for, for the presentation, also. Um, I have to go back to yeah, what a slide. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Chapters that range from all sorts of what is called wider questions as well around like the way in which disenfranchised communities are not represented in PG. And actually, it's really fascinating. Sorry, just to stop flying around again, but um, there's really fascinating history there. Wakefield is fascinating with this. Like, they have a very antithesis of PG. They, they don't see it as, as something that's normalized. But yeah, if you look at Leeds, where there's a massive uni, it's quite tall, you can see it, Grand City, it's very different because. Oh, that, well, that's why they don't work. That's why they, that's why they work. You know, it's a different spatial understanding of it, which is fascinating. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the relationship between the community and the community itself is going to be a, a number chapter in there. Um, and we're going to explore whether there's a very, maybe, is that relation to influence by neoliberal paradigms versus more social justice ones? Because we, I think, the better is, want to be more in terms of access and helping. And, and what are university positions themselves as? Are we giving that? And I think that's a that's maybe a critical question, but I think it's one worth worth perhaps exploring. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Sorry, no, no, no. Uh, thank you, thank you. Actually, my question is: Do you have a notion of social justice, and how do you apply for for your work? Yeah, because it's not a simple definition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say the Rawlsian kind of broad definition is what I'm probably going to apply to. I think for me, it's about ensuring that those. Rates I mentioned at the beginning, the 47% of non FSM who um, receive an SSM, you know, go to university and the 20% of the aren't. Those things being much more narrow. But I don't think they really care about the philosophical definitions. Of okay. And I think that's that's a good point, though. The fact that perhaps it should. <laughs> a little bit more, you know, I think it's a just a point. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a good It's point. not more about the environment that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. They don't want to reflect on those debates, actually. to like a local employer for the city to come in and explain 
what you could do with an engineering degree, and you could get a job at some sort. And that was where I ended up at different But again, it's quite nice about each other as well. Um, but yeah, it is, it is silly. There's daft affinity, but don't seem to be about an answer much. But yeah, actually, it can be quite important in terms of generating conversation in my life what it's had. Um, and that's a lot harder to do than it might sound about the sense that like, creating that environment to do that. And you have to have the right staff, the right position, the right people, um, and so on. And we trained up staff to ensure that they were capable of dealing with any challenges as well. Because obviously some people will. I didn't like it, but do something else. <laughs> it was good like it. So there's always always a way for you to do. Um, the first question about BMA groups and uh, groups and um, fast, yeah, absolutely. We saw the big differences in all sorts of things. Again, by target group, by care leaders, by traffic communities, well, those kind of things, they are particularly hostile uh, um, and and then basically, you know, engaging with them was very much from charities that have long standing relationships with them. So then you could build off that more than anything else. And then there's trust there to begin with. Um, but we, we didn't go in there saying, hey, HG's is great. We went in there saying, talk in a reflexive, kind of more professive way. So it wasn't really about, uh, and that was really important. It wasn't about HGL, it was, it was about a fee and other things too, as well. And I think the point you make about um, parents, so it's really interesting. With, with, with the VA, the, the Bay groups, um, we, had, we did have differences. And a lot of them trusted HG and so on, but there's more information and definitely around how do I negotiate these things, especially with languages and such stuff as well. Um, so it was, it was a lot a lot of that side of it was more about kind of explaining and building those blanks and those gaps as well. Um, and then you build those kind of trust. And, and, and of course through that you build a trust a relationship that you need as well. Um, was that good? I got through the new Okay, so so what's the question? Oh, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Traditionally, in HG, that's always been the story, basically. Uh, if you have, basically, people who've got kind of A's at A level, they tend to choose more local universities that have got uh, the working class background tradition. Um, I think that's shifted a little in recent years, um, with better information giving and so on, but I think we still see that quite a lot. And I think that the challenging thing about that is the inequalities at the beginning of the process retain all the way through HG process itself and the graduate labor market as well. And there's a fantastic piece of work by Furlong. It's quite old now, from 2005, but he, he basically found that those inequalities left all the way through to basically labor market position much later, 10 years on. So, so questions of social mobility obviously are raised for some of these things. Um, and I think it's a kind of a problem with that. Right, any questions from the people of the team? Okay, I have some questions for you. I'm going to be the devil's advocate. No, because I'm sometimes I like to be that. What would you say to people who argue that the best way to encourage social mobility and opportunities through apprenticeships rather than a university career? And actually, it's more economic and it's quicker. It allows them to access the market. Right. 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 Of course, instead of you know, following the university pathway, which they may not like, actually. I would say they should check the critical data. <laughs> because if you look at apprenticeships, you need level three for them to be anywhere near the graduate premium. There is a thirty thousand pound average for a graduate in the UK. For apprenticeship, it's about fifty-two to five-ish. Masters, about thirty-five, and so on. So the, the the degree is still financially much more viable to do. One of the problems is apprenticeships aren't all university at the same quality and level. So if you have level one or two apprenticeships, um, they might not get to those outcomes you're creating. So they are quick, they're cheap, but they aren't necessarily as the same quality of the degree. So that's the problem. However, if I may, if you had apprenticeships at level three and you could universe like that, great employers, and you have universities involved in them and they could be the same, that's different. It's about the quality of that provision itself. And it's frustrating this. Government have really framed it in that way, like apprenticeship models and, and that thing. It's wrong to say it's all about AG, but it's also wrong to say it's all about apprenticeships. It's about the what works for your person. And what works for the companies are in, and so forth. So I, 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 I think it's really just. I think unfortunately that is a policy narrative we are not seeing quite a lot as well. Um, and that's a, an interesting contradiction, I think, where where you know we, we need a labour market that provides all sorts of different skills as well. And um, you need to get a to that level. 
right, and what would you say to some very skeptics that say the university is not for everybody? And the typical question of discerning ability uh, and willingness, because it can be the product of social circumstances, of socialization, or family and income. But in the end, there are some benchmarks in which we judge people from ability and say, you're not good enough, whereas this might reflect all these background conditions that have been raised. I mean, I, I absolutely, I think it's a really fair point in many ways, to be honest. I don't think we should normalize any outcome for the young people. I think that's dangerous. I, I've already university has to that way. But I also think the fairly, I, I, I did a paper last year about labor market jobs for entry jobs for people, they just collapse. There aren't jobs for them to do the same as there were when I was you know? And because of those things being so, that context being so dependent, university is, is the only option because there's not the kind of, the alternatives for them to get do. Again, apprenticeships are part of that, but jobs themselves being worthwhile and high quality is all sorts of skills and all sorts of part of that. So I, I think that's a really, really fair point. I think the ability question, we should have an education system like that, reflects different abilities, and then also reflects those different outcomes in different ways. But it's, the, the issue is that this is often very good supply side of measures. Um, more individual kind of skill focus, more individual kind of, like, you know, whereas actually you need better trust, you better opportunities for people, regardless of university level or at leaving school or college, you know. And unfortunately, I don't think there's been enough focus on that um, in recent years. And I think that is why we're seeing that move towards the team on the other And the other thing is young people are choosing it because I think it represents their their people they like the idea of going to go into this, this place where they can learn for three years and become an adult. There's a social there's an interesting sociological part of it. So it's becoming an, an almost a you know, I'm part of this community that can do that and make you talk about that and generate friendships through that. There's, there's a really fascinating dynamic around that side of it. As much as it's about the economics, it's also about how they see themselves as people, right? And I think that's the really interesting aspect. And in the policy discourse, that's never talked about. <laughs> they always talk about the economics and never the why people are doing it themselves. All right, okay. Uh, if, we, if we don't have any other questions, I'll ask the last provocative one. You are a scholar of social justice, and you're driven by considerations of social justice. Is there any social justice justification of spending so much, so many resources yeah, yeah. in catering only for students who are from the UK, Absolutely. rather than you know, widening yeah. participation outside of the UK? I think because uh, so, to yeah. some extent, foreign students are the ones who can afford to buy exorbitant uh, uh, prices. Uh, it's a country with, a, with, with, with very high tuition fees, and the subsidized at the uh, uh, students from the UK. Is this social justice quite nationalistic, essentially? Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. It's, 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 an it's an interesting question. I, I think, actually, I think, I, I think there's an absolute point that international students are essentially being charged so much more than domestic students. And that is, for me, that's, that is problematic. There is definitely an issue around, around the fairness of that. WP is an interesting one because these are groups that, without this type of work, would not be good universities. And I don't know. You know, I, I, again, vulnerability and need here, and who do you compare and contrast? It's, it's an interesting dynamic, and I think there's, there's kind of complications around that. Um, but I think it's a really interesting point around the way in which we frame who is in need of, of government you know, focus, attention, and thought. Um, I don't have an answer to that really, beyond, it's probably on the scope of my work here, but I think in terms of social justice, your situation has to be. You've got essentially what's university for? Is it for fairness? Is it for the economy? Is it for, and that's going to be a thing that relies or, or dictates your answers to that question, isn't it? And that in the UK context, I think unfortunately is moving more towards kind of economic paradigms and it is perhaps around fairness and equality. Um, and I think that's that is why you see the inequality spread out, it's why you see so many being exploited. You can even say, is, is, is it fair that? You know, maybe university is not the right option for many people. You know, are we, you know, this, this question enough as well? We could do this. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really, really interesting point. And I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's exactly how you frame it. It's a big, 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 big idea question. Right, well, uh, let me check again. If it's, uh, if there are no questions from the audience, which is fine. Thank you very much for this thought provoking presentation. Please come to the end on the 8th of March, we have a presentation from Mark, uh, by Marco Yama from Cambridge on the Magna Carta. So please be here.